So today we're going to talk about two two basic things. We're going to first of all I'm going to talk about the biggest pitfall that keeps us stuck in habitual sin. So this is the the part we kind of skip over because people don't really emphasize it a lot when we're talking about growing in virtue and growing in the spiritual life. They tend to overemphasize the second half. Um, but if you don't do this first step, the second half just gets you stuck. It's kind of that's where that hamster wheel starts to happen. So we're going to talk about that to make sure that we're we're all on board with that first part. And then I'm going to talk about basically a six step process for developing virtue. And this is very practical. This is very kind of step by step. I'm still perfecting that checklist. So what you guys have as a handout is basically these six steps and then these these sub checks that you can kind of go through as you're going through the six steps. So you'll understand them better as we go through. And I left some room for you to make some notes um, beside each step. So if something kind of, if, if it starts to make more sense to you as you're listening to it, make sure you write that down because you, you may not remember by the time you get home if you don't write it down. So that's going to be basically the session today. Um, and I will try to keep it in a timely manner. But first, I want to just kind of give you this imagery. Let's say you've got a, an orchard and you've got one tree that just keeps producing rotten apples. Now, you have two options. You could keep trying to just pick off all the rotten apples because that's how the disease spread. If the, if the rotten apples fall on the ground, then the disease will spread to other trees. Just let's just say. So you can either spend all of your time trying to pick every new apple that comes off of that tree right? And if you do that, it's going to take you years and it's going to be nonstop and you will never ever see the end of it because the, the tree will constantly continue to produce more apples or you can cut the tree down. Which one of the two options do you want? <laughs> Which one of the two options is going to make your life easiest? Cut it down. Cut it down. Absolutely. So the difference here is we often become too behaviorally focused when growing in virtue and not focused enough on the heart. So what happens when we focus on the behavior is that's where the war starts, that war between the flesh and the soul. Because your flesh wants something and your soul wants something and, and your soul, that's where your heart is. So if your soul and your flesh are constantly in battle with each other, you can try and try and try to change these behaviors and change these behaviors and change these behaviors. But if your heart is not convinced that that is what it wants, you are fighting a battle that will leave you exhausted. And that is where we end up kind of banging our head against the wall all the time. Now, God is very clear about this. I have many scripture verses I'm going to throw at you and I am not even throwing at you the bulk of them. But in Matthew 15, and this is, we heard it actually at church not that long ago, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Blessed is the man who always fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. So again, if your heart isn't being convinced, that trouble is going to follow you. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. So good things come out of the good stored up in our hearts. So if we want virtue to be what comes out of us, it has to start with the heart. And he continues and he says, the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And we all have evil stored up in our hearts. And this is where our sin comes from. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. That grace, it's going to flow from our heart. So on that first session, when I said virtue is what makes life easy, there's an, and it's, it's, it makes moral actions and moral decisions easy when you have virtue. And what is acquired virtue? The purpose of acquired virtue is to chip away at all of our vice so that infused grace and infused virtue can flow freely. This is the river of life. This is the river of grace that will flow freely when your heart is transformed. And I could keep going, but I'll stop there. So virtue is not a behavior. 
Virtue is a disposition of the heart. This is the key point. If you walk away with anything today, this is what I want you to walk away from. Virtue is not a behavior. Virtue is a disposition of the heart. Now, what do I mean by a disposition of the heart? We know that sin, we kind of have probably all heard this. You can lift your hand if you have. That sin is like, an, it's an archery. Uh, it's a word that comes from archery and missing, missing the mark. Have you ever heard of that? Right? So you have this big bullseye, right? And if you sin, it's when you miss the mark. Now, what most people don't realize is virtue is what has you pointed towards the target. And vice is what has you pointed on the other way. Now, try to hit that target if your feet aren't pointing in the right direction. Good luck. Like, it's way, way harder. Disposition turns you towards the target. That's repentance. Repentance is turning away from our sin towards God. So this is the whole point of virtue. The whole point of virtue is turning ourselves towards God. In our last session, what did we end off with? Whatever we end up doing, right? Whatever we love, whatever we desire, whatever we want is whatever we judge to be good. At the, at the root of everything we do, is a judgment of something being good, something that we want, a good that we want to be united to. Every single behavior is motivated by wanting to be united to some good. And so that's where that heart comes from. If your heart is motivated by love for God, you will have virtue. If your heart is motivated by love for things of the physical world, and that only means that the physical world becomes your end, right? Then you will have vice. And that it's, it's really that simple. But more often than not, we're just told, stop sinning. Stop doing that. <laughs> that thing you do, just stop doing that and you'll be good. But we're very rarely taught how to actually go deeper, dig down to the heart, and look at what's not working there. Because sin tells you, what part of your heart isn't yet disposed towards God? So sin is like this big flashing arrow that tells you, hey, look here, <laughs> this is where you want to go. This is where you want to look because there's a treasure to be found here. And that treasure is God's love. Because ultimately what's going on is that part of your heart hasn't yet been encountered by, like hasn't yet encountered God. It hasn't yet been filled by God. It hasn't yet been satisfied by God. Now, if I tell you, you're somebody who maybe doesn't have home, doesn't have work, can't feed themselves. And I tell you, hey, don't eat McDonald's. McDonald's is bad for you. McDonald's is going to poison you. You'll eventually die. But your only other option is to not eat. What are you going to do? You're going to eat McDonald's. You're hungry, You're, you need food. Your heart is hungry and it needs love. And everything we do when we sin is an attempt to be filled with love. And so this is why there's, it's actually fantastic when you notice a habitual sin. It's incredible because it's, this is God actually giving you light in your intellect because you cannot know your own sin without God's grace. You are blind to it. That's part of the, that's part of what happens from the fall. We are blind to our own sin. We all know people who cannot seem to see that they're sinning. Like they just like, they're just totally like deer in the headlights. What are you talking about? That's wrong. We're the same way. And the only way we can actually see what we're doing wrong is if God lets us know that it's wrong. And if God has let you know that it's wrong, that's because he wants you to go there. But more importantly, because he wants you to take him there. And so we need to start actually paying attention to our sin, not being scared of it. Shame, like there's a certain level of shame that's good, right? We should be like, okay, yeah, that was wrong. But then we should explore it with curiosity because we have faith in God going, oh Lord, what do you want to show me here? 
The image that comes to mind for me is honestly, it's a treasure map, right? And, and sins are like these big X's on the treasure map that tell me where to dig. Because there's something buried there that I want that's going to be amazing and it's going to change my life when I get to it. And so that's basically the process that I want to start kind of taking you through. Now, digging through your heart takes time. I have sat with habitual sin sometimes for a few years digging and digging and digging and digging, going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until I finally hit that eureka moment of like, there's that pot of gold. And, and I mean, I have dealt with habitual mortal sin and I have dealt with just habitual small little sins. And it's the same process for all of them. Habitual mortal sins usually take longer because there's usually something big waiting for you there. Now what? The devil does not want you to go there. Okay, this is why we start to experience fear when we look, when we look at our sin, right? And that shame that makes us hide from God. That only came after the fall. That only started happening after we sinned, hiding from God. God doesn't want us to hide from him. God wants to expose it. And so how do we change our heart? How do we allow and like kind of journey with God down into the heart? And that's, that's basically in a big way what step one is. And step one is one of those things where you can start, you can start with step one and then you can move on to all the other steps. But step one is, is never, it never ends. You don't complete step one. I mean, you might come to that point where you finally really understand and know and have that full transformation of the heart. But at that point, then you just, you go to the next area. But on your journey to developing that virtue, you need to be constantly examining and searching your heart. And this is already built into church tradition. Like the examination of conscience. St. Ignatius' daily examine. That's actually, if you want a very structured practice for learning how to do this, St. Ignatius' spiritual exercise, and in particular his daily examine, is like the key to unlocking and developing the capacity to do this. Obviously having a spiritual director to kind of like help you or having a spiritual mentor is really helpful because they're wise and they can see much more than you can um, and they can kind of help to guide you. But that being said, you're not completely helpless. You do have tools that you can access. And St. Ignatius is really, that's what he does most of the time. He works with the heart. He's, he's that beginner. He's really great for beginners. I mean, he's great for everybody else. But for those of us really trying to become in tune with the spiritual life and in tune with the movements of our hearts, that's what he's all about, movements of the hearts. He's all about the heart. St. Ignatius is a, an amazing tool for that. So step one, you want to pick one area. One. <laughs> you do not need to fix all of your sins all at once. So I want you, <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. I want you to actually go into prayer and say, Lord, what's keeping me from being in union with you? Like what area of my heart do you want to explore with me? And like, I really want, I would actually want every, every single person to spend a few weeks on step one before they go anywhere else. We're in such a rush. Like, of course we want to stop sinning. And like, that's, that's good. You want to, like, if there's behaviors, especially mortal sins that are keeping you from, because mortal sins will destroy the sanctifying grace that you have in you. So you, you definitely want to make sure you're keeping, going to confession as often as you possibly can with those, but really search your heart and don't rush this part. Ask God for the grace to see clearly. Do not do this on your own. Do not do this out of your own strength <laughs> because you will, you will fail. Like you will not be able to see what parts of your hearts are, are hidden and starving without God's help. He, he needs to be there with you. He needs to be walking there with you. Number three, name the emotion you are experiencing. This is, can be actually incredibly difficult. <laughs> If we are not quickly able to name what we're feeling and what we're thinking, this is something we need to develop. 
This is the ability to be aware, but that's actually the virtue of prudence. The ability to be self-aware, to know ourselves, to know what's moving in our hearts, how it's motivating us, the scripts that we're telling ourselves in our head all the time. The ability to develop that is critical for growing in virtue because prudence is ultimately where you judge moral goods. And all of our, all of our actions come from there. And so this is the first step is learning, learning, naming your emotions that you're experiencing and use that session four that I did last week. Use that little handout that I gave you guys that just like briefly tells you what each emotion is. And, and you can kind of like follow it down, down the road. So for example, I really like was noticing that there was like a bit of sloth kind of like coming into creeping into my life, especially at the beginning of the year in January. Yeah, I could have just been like, oh, it's just the weather. And like, I just need sunshine and then I'll be fine. But ultimately there was a reality that even going to church felt like a chore and there was like a dread towards it. Uh, doing my dishes felt like a really heavy weight. Like it, there was a just a general like dread towards the small duties of the moment that I had to do. And so I started to kind of pay attention to that. And I started to realize that the emotion that was underlying that was actually fear, interestingly enough. And there was, um, and it was actually a fear of shame. Like, so shame is a type of fear, right? So there's a fear of people's judgments because at the time I was making really big changes in my life and transitions and taking really big leaps of faith <laughs> that I was really, and I was really afraid of what people were going to say and what people were going to think about me. So it's interesting how all of a sudden, oh, not doing my dishes as I started to reflect on that brought me all the way to like, wow, okay, so actually <laughs> I'm just scared. I'm scared of what other people are going to think. And this fear has become so like, has consumed my heart so much that it's impacting my capacity to do the, the duties of the moment. And it's making me dread everything because every time I looked at the dishes, I also thought about all the work I had to do, these associations. So this ability to be self-aware is incredible, right? And, and one of the big pieces that are, are gonna help you grow in virtue. Then you wanna basically follow that down as much as you can. And this is the part that takes the longest <laughs> is name the good you believe you're getting. So like I said, every behavior is ultimately there to try and unite you to some good. So every time you do something, it's ultimately to try and unite yourself to something you believe is good, something you believe is going to bring you some kind of a satisfaction. So what is it? right? What is it about not doing my dishes? What is it about not going to church? What is it that I think I'm getting from that, from that choice? And that's, that's where you're, you're starting to get really deep into the motivation, into basically where you're pointing to, where are you looking? Where's your heart looking? Because that's ultimately what you're trying to do, right? When you're trying to decide what am I actually wanting here? What am I actually desiring here? you're actually figuring out where your feet are as far as where that target is. And that's important because you need to know that so that you can switch it around so that you can actually start to turn those feet towards the right target. And every single time we choose an evil, it's always under the aspect of the good. Okay. So that means that we can choose a sin, but we're, what we're really focusing on, we're not focusing on the fact that it's a sin. We're focusing on the good that it's getting us. But it's important to pay attention to that good because it's actually the, it's an aspect of God. It's a reflection of something good about God. And so it actually reveals to us something about who God is. And so all of your sins actually have the capacity to teach you about who God is and how God wants to satisfy your heart. And so all of a sudden you're digging in and you're not just getting to know yourself, you're getting to know God. And what is humility but knowing ourselves as we truly are and knowing God as he truly is? And so not only are you developing prudence during this step, you're actually developing humility in this step. And prudence and humility are like the key combination for any virtue. 
Just like pride is the root of all vice, humility will root you in all virtue. And prudence just helps you make the right decision, <laughs> which is also helpful. So once you get a better idea of what it is you really want, that good that you really want, and what I realized, especially with sloth kind of like dipping into my life, what I really wanted was to be prompt and obedient to God's will. I didn't want people's opinions to stop me from doing God's will. I wanted to just do it. Like the minute God said, do something, I just did it. So the word that came to me was promptness. I wanted prompt obedience. That was the virtue that I wanted to develop within myself. And so then I started to think to myself, like, what does my day look like if I had prompt obedience? If I was prompt to doing the duty of the moment, you need to use your imagination for this. So I actually walked myself through my day. Oh, well, I would get out of bed the minute my alarm rang and I would go turn it off. I'd get dressed. I'd go downstairs and I would just start my day. I'd get to my prayer. I wouldn't drag. I'd start my prayer right away. I wouldn't distract myself for 10 minutes with my thoughts. Like, and, and as I'm walking through, it's like, okay, and then I'd be on time for mass all the time. I'd for sure be on time for the rosary. All of my dishes would be done. My house would be clean. My laundry would be done. My laundry would be put away. I start, it was just like, wow, like actually there are so many areas of my day that would be positively impacted by me being just prompt, prompt to the duty of the moment. And the other impact that I realized it would have, and this actually, like, it was as I started to incorporate it, one of the benefits that I saw was I actually had more time to rest because I didn't procrastinate. And, and instead of spending, and all really I was doing when I was procrastinating was spending time in anxiety, right? Because I knew what I needed to do, but then I was just like, like, how is that benefiting me? You know, when you like think about the situation itself, you're like, wait a minute, what's the actual good here? Is there even a good? Because all I'm doing is torturing myself for 10 to 15 minutes before I actually just go and do what I should have just done 10, 15 minutes ago. And, and after that, I was able to rest more. And then I was in a better mood. I was able to manage my anxiety more and it was easier to be prompt. And so it started this, what you would call a virtuous cycle instead of a vicious cycle all of these small little things. Now, one of the things when it comes to developing a new image, okay, and again, I'm just gonna pull back why we wanna develop a new image, because your intellect, right, which is your the virtue of prudence, needs an image to pull a concept, right? The image is what will present the possibility of a new concept to, the, to your intellect. And so the more you develop a good image, image in your imagination of what this virtue looks like, you're giving ammunition to your intellect. And it's going to make it easier for your intellect to make that right judgment. And so that image is critical. Find models, find people who already exemplify this, this virtue. It could be a saint, it could be somebody you already just know in your daily life, right? Maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your roommate, maybe it's a coworker that has this virtue in their life already that you really admire and pay attention to them. And because when, here's the cool thing, a little bit of psychology in here, 20% of your neurons are what you call mirror neurons. Okay, so mirror neurons are, they're literally their whole job <laughs> is to pay attention to what other people are doing and to fire in your brain and wire in your brain those behaviors as if you were doing it yourself. So when you watch somebody else do something good, 20% of your brain thinks that you're doing it, that you're the one that's doing it, just by watching somebody else do it. And science has also proven you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So it has a huge impact on how you actually develop and the beliefs that you develop and the behaviors that you develop. So finding models is an incredible way to actually start to develop the wiring process. And, and when I say wiring, basically what we're doing is we're, we're bringing the flesh into submission to the will, right? That's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do, but this is the scientific kind of word for it. So finding models, because then <laughs> before you even start doing the virtue, you're developing it. Isn't that amazing? 
God is good. God wants us to succeed. He's given us all kinds of little hidden tips and tricks that I'll be <laughs> giving you over, over the course of this session that help you. Now, what you ultimately want to be able to do at the end of step two and before you can kind of move on to step three is you want to summarize that image in one to five words for easy recall. So it's a recall tool. Some people will call this a script. Okay, now obviously our image and our script, it might be good for you to seek counsel and make sure that you're actually, that you're, that you're on the right track and that you're not, <laughs> and that your heart isn't being kind of duped into thinking that it's following a real good when it's not, right? Because we haven't developed perfect prudence. We have to be aware of that. And so it's good to go to the church and go, what does the church teach about this when it comes to morals? What does my spiritual director think about this, right? What does maybe if there's a spiritual mentor or somebody that you just admire in the spiritual life that you think is very wise, what, what get some feedback on, on whether or not like this is a, a good thing to want before you start <laughs> stepping into the other, the other pieces, because we don't want you doing hard work just to have to undo it later. So you just, you want to make sure that you're actually focusing on a real good before you go over. But leveling up with scripture is what I have there. So if you can have a recall tool that's actually scripture, then that recall tool becomes like, it's like amplified because scripture is the living word. There's power in scripture. There's like, there's, a, there's just going to be more grace available to you if you use scripture. It's not necessary. I didn't use scripture. I literally just used the word prompt. That was all I needed to pull to pull this image of all the good that would, that would come along with promptness. But that's exactly the image we want. We want to, we want to be able to easily recall the good, the good that we want in this new virtue. That's ultimately it because the will <laughs> and your whole body and your appetites all flow from what you believe is good. So if you have that good in your mind, your body will just like, it won't even be able to like stop itself. It'll just naturally go towards that good behavior. So developing that new image and easy recall is a really big part of it. So every time I would walk up to my dishes, I would feel dread and I would take a minute. I would just take a five seconds, take a deep breath and I go, and I would just say promptness in my head. The image would kind of like come back. I would just kind of sit with it for a minute and then it was like, all of a sudden I had this energy towards doing the dishes and it was like, okay, yes, this is what I want. Doing the dishes is good because it's helping me achieve this end. And so then I was able to do my dishes and, and I did that over and over and over and over again until it's actually come to the point now. Okay, and I've taken what's well, been two months. <laughs> I have taken two months and now I'm at the point where if my dishes are dirty, I'm just like, let's just do them right now. Like, and it's not even, I don't feel dread when I see my, di my dishes anymore. And it's just like, oh, like it's like, it's a, I, I dread the TV. Cause I'm just like, no, like I, I really actually want my kitchen to just be clean. I want to just do this right now. And so it's taken two months of repetition and intentionality, a lot of intentionality, but now I'm finally at that point, but it's not just my dishes. That promptness has moved itself into my entire life, but I used the dishes as the, as the means, as the behavior that I focused on to help develop it. The minute you develop a virtue, it will naturally bleed into everything else. So that's the good thing. So pick one behavior for this. This is the other part that people are never told. You have to create a procedural memory. Okay. Think of a recipe card. You need to actually know exactly what all the steps are before you will be able to accomplish it. So if you are trying to build a prayer routine, you need to actually sit down and write out your morning routine and where prayer will fall into it. What's it like getting out of bed? What do you do immediately out at once you get out of bed? So for example, I'll give you my morning routine. I have it here, it was supposed to be up on the screen. Five o'clock, I wake up. 5.05, I'm making coffee downstairs and I'm cleaning the kitchen and, and tidying it up. By 5.20, I'm preparing my space for prayer. I'm lighting up the candles and I'm turning on all the lights and I'm pulling all of my prayer materials out. By 5.25, I'm sitting and I'm praying. By 6.30, this is typically where I would do some exercise, although I'm switching that up. 6.50, I would shower, get ready, 
7.30, start the car. 7.40, leave for Mass. 7.45, I'm sitting in church doing my rosary. 8 o'clock Mass. And then I come home, and by 9 o'clock, I start my workday. And so you have to actually write that down. If you don't have an intentional time for prayer, if you don't have a routine built around your prayer, you are not going to have regular prayer. Like, and that, that has to happen. And so you, and you need, you need to be very specific, very step-by-step. Step. Imagine cooking a chicken if you didn't know all the steps. You'd have the chicken in front of you and you go, well, I know I want it cooked. I know there, I kind of have to use the oven. <sighs> yeah, right? You're not confident. You're not competent. And so it's, it's anxiety inducing. You kind of sit frazzled a little bit, not knowing what to do. And it's not a pleasant experience. We need procedural memory. And this we can do for behaviors as well. So for example, if you want to create just a procedural memory for prayer itself. So for me, it's, I have to go turn on the light, light the candles. I grab my journal, my Bible and my pens. I place them on the coffee table. And then I spend five minutes. This is how I start. I spend five minutes in the presence of God. Then I open my Bible to that day's scripture. I read my scripture. I underline any parts that stick out during that piece. Then I write out each line individually in my notebook or in my journal. Any line that stuck out to me, I write a few notes about what my thoughts were around that and what my emotions or the movements of my hearts were around that. And then I will end in our father. And so this is my procedural memory for prayer. I have a system in my prayer time so that when I get to prayer, I know what I'm doing and there's a structure. You know, God is a God of order and God is a God of structure. I mean, look around you. Everything he does is creative and yet it's structured. And so we want to be flexible, yes, but we are also typically what we need first is structure. And then it's like, it's like somebody who's learning piano. They need to learn where all the notes are first and then they can compose music unless you're really good with your ears. Okay, then you maybe don't need to know where exactly all the notes are. But typically there's a basic skill set that we need before we can get creative and before we can kind of become that kind of more professional piece. And so just being humble enough to say, hey, I'm not succeeding in my prayer because I actually don't have a structure to my prayer. And there's all kinds of tools out there that you can use for developing structure. Sometimes that makes it harder because there's too many choices. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but even just to picking up, picking up a spiritual book, like um, I'm sure you guys all are pr pretty familiar with Jacques Philippe and like his, his small little books. You read one, one little chunk, one little number, you know, it's like half a page or maybe a page long. And you meditate on that with your journal and you write notes about your thoughts and about your me and about what you're feeling. Not, dear journal, today I went for coffee and it was awesome. That's not journaling in prayer. Journaling in prayer means jotting down thoughts and movements of the heart. So it can be point form. You can totally write longer form if that's your style, if that's kind of what works for you. But I just do point form and it's amazing. It's way better for me. <laughs> Step four is really simple. Be honest with yourself about how you're going to feel when you have to start that new behavior. Okay, if you are not going to be excited about it, be honest with yourself about that. I am not going to be excited when I get to my dishes. I'm going to feel dread. Then walk yourself through the procedural memory in your imagination. Okay, I'm but I'm going to do my dishes anyways, right? I'm doing my dishes. Boom. At the end of the, at the end of the dishes, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to feel relief because my kitchen is clean and it's done and that feels really good. So then you, you kind of go, that's how I'm going to feel at the end of having done that procedure. So you want to actually tell your brain because remember emotions are triggered by the imagination as well. And you can actually create emotional associations and plop those into your imagination. So what, you, what you're trying to do in this is you're trying to create, tell your brain, hey, I'm going to have a positive transformation when, when I do this behavior. So you're trying to preemptively tell your flesh what it's going to feel. <laughs> and that's, that's, and this, these are all, everything I'm telling you to do, this is all your intellect that's actually in charge right now. And that's doing all of these steps.
So it's your soul that is walking through all of these steps and instructing your flesh on how to behave because your, your, your flesh has been habituated, right? And it will not, if it does not know what it needs to do instead, and it is not clear on that, it won't do it. So your intellect actually has to instruct your flesh through the imagination. And this is what we're doing in this process. Okay. And then step five is basically taking those four steps and training your brain with it. So let's say you were back in, I don't know, when, when, when did people do sword fights, like uh, wars with swords and stuff like that, medieval times, back in the medieval times, medieval days, and somebody told you that you were going to go to battle, but you'd never been trained on how to use a sword. How long do you think you're going to last in that war? <laughs> Not very long, right? Why? Because you don't know how to use your sword. You don't know how to defend yourself and you don't know how to attack. We need to train virtue inside of our brain. And our imagination is where we do that. It's our training ground. So that when we are in battle, as in we are being tempted, we're trained on what to do. We know how to use our sword. And so we are far more effective against the temptation. So this is the other piece that we're never told. We have a training ground in our imagination. Your intellect is what tells you what's real and what's not real. Your imagination has no idea. It has no idea that what you're imagining and picturing in your head is not actually happening. So when you practice speaking calmly to somebody when you're in conflict in your head, so imagine, right, you know you're, all, you're getting all huffy because you're angry with somebody and you're like, oh, I need to go talk to them about this. And you kind of go, okay, wait, calm. I'm going to be calm and I'm going to be gentle. And you imagine your head, a calm and gentle tone. And you imagine the words and you imagine the conversation and you imagine yourself actually doing this in a calm and a gentle way. And all of a sudden you do this over and over and over and over again. When you actually get to that pit place where you have to do conflict resolution, you're going to have an arsenal now of calm and gentle images of yourself ready to go that you can <coughs> tap into because you already know how to do it because you practiced it. We need to use our imagination and we need to do it outside of temptation. <laughs> we need to do it before we're tempted if we want to actually be effective against temptation. And so there are five main ways we can practice writing. So let's say you're, if you're, if you're starting a new routine and you're trying to create a procedural memory, literally write it out on a piece of paper. The more you engage your sensory, your senses, the, the richer the sensory memory will be and the faster it will rewire in your brain. And so the, you'll have to spend less time basically training. You'll just train faster. You'll, you'll get there faster. Reading, reading about that virtue. Like if you want to be more humble, <laughs> reading about humility will help with that. It will help give you images. It will help to rewire that virtue for you. Reciting, you could say it out loud, right? So you could say, okay, so 5 a.m. I'm going to wake up. 5.05, I'm going to be making coffee downstairs. You can just say it out loud instead of writing it down. Again, you're using your voice. And so it's going to have a stronger impact in your memory. Meditating, so that would be visualizing. So actually sitting down and visualizing yourself. I use this for getting out of bed in the morning and starting an exercise routine. I would actually sit in bed and I would visualize myself putting on my exercise clothes, going downstairs, like moving the coffee table, casting the workout onto my TV, doing the workout, and then and then ending the workout. Like I would actually visualize, visualize that before going to bed. And then when I woke up in the morning, that was actually fresh because I'd done it just before going to bed. And so it was an easy image to recall. And it was much easier to actually do because I, I, had, I had just recalled that procedural memory recently. And so that's just a trick too. And step six, of course, don't do it on your own. Get supernatural help. Why would you try to do it all by yourself, okay? But here's the thing. When you go to mass, you go to mass with that intention. Lord, show me what my heart is missing. Show me how it is that I'm not choosing you yet. 
Show me how to choose you. Increase that desire within me. When you go to confession, keep a special eye on that vice or that behavior and how it's been impacting your life. And, and make sure you're confessing it regularly. Every time, you, every time you commit a sin, you sign a contract with a demon. And confession breaks it. So it is an incredibly important tool to use. More than once a year, like at least once a month if you can. If you're serious about growing in virtue, honestly, every two weeks even, if not even every week. I just I don't want to tell people to go crazy. I personally think confession on a weekly basis keeps me real sharp. Scrupulosity is a thing too. Scrupulosity is a thing too, yes. But that's you cannot measure the heart through behavior. So somebody can go to confession once a month and struggle with scrupulosity and somebody can go to confession every day and not. So you cannot measure or judge the heart through a behavior. It can be, it can be a, a signal. You can kind of be like, oh, okay, maybe I should look into that to make sure the heart's okay. But you can't actually judge the heart through the behavior. Sacramentals. Like if you're struggling with a lot of distractions in prayer, well, light, light a blessed candle. You know, make sure that your, your rosary is blessed. Um, use some holy water, some holy oil. They, they, have sacram- they have graces in them and strengths in them that you, can ta- like that you can tap into. We're sensory, remember? We need sensory things to help us connect to the spiritual. Um, so sacramentals are really good. And of course, prayer and fasting. Because like I said, you need to search the heart and you need to transform the heart. That's the only way that you're really effectively going to have a change in behavior and a, and a growth in virtue that, that you won't, basically where you're going to stop banging your head against a wall with a vice. And the only way you're going to do that is if you're praying. You, like you'll never succeed at this unless you're having a regular prayer life. And so if you don't have a regular prayer life, I would suggest that that be the first place <laughs> that you start as far as using this process would just be trying to use it to get yourself praying and fasting because it's the quickest way to temper your appetites and your appetites are often what bind your will and your intellect. And so fasting and, and I'm going to be very clear about this. Okay. Unless you have a medical condition, fast from food. As I have been hearing this way too often, you don't need to fast from food. Yes, you do. Fasting, as its definition, is abstinence from food. Mortification is what we call fasting from social media, fasting from all of these other things. That's mortification. Fasting is fasting from food. And biologically, the impact that fasting from food will have on your body is far greater than anything else. And it will, it will bring about the temperance of that appetite like nothing else will. Um, and so really, really encouraging strongly fasting from food if you can. And I'm not talking like three days here. If you can skip breakfast. Hey, if you cannot eat for an hour more in the morning than what you typically did, you're fasting, right? Don't discount that. That's how I started. I literally started, I think with half an hour to an hour because I thought it was the most brutal thing in the world. Okay. It took me a long time to develop that virtue, right? To do, to basically temp get my body to be submissive to those desires. So fast. Um, okay. Now I'm just going to give you guys a couple fun facts. I already gave you one about the imagination. Basically, whatever you do in your imagination, your body will wire and your body will respond to as if it's really present. Keep that in mind for your vices. If you're constantly fighting with somebody in your head, you're, you're, if you fight with that person once in real life, but you fight with them a hundred times in your head, your body will remember 101 fights. So your thoughts and managing your thoughts is critical. Okay. But you have the same power for your imagination. You may only practice the virtue once in real life, but if you do it 100 times in your imagination, your body will wire it as if you've done it 101 times. And that's amazing. So just being intentional with that. You have what we call a reticular activating system, and I love this thing. It is the coolest. Okay, so I'm going to tell you all. Can you feel your chairs? Now that I'm telling you to pay attention to them, did you feel them before I told you to pay attention? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, well, maybe, maybe if they're a little sore. But like most of the time when we're sitting and we're working and we're listening and we're doing all these other things, Sorry, it's all good, it's all good. Most of the time when we're doing all of these things, we actually have sensory experiences that we block, that we just don't pay attention to. Is it because they're not there? Is it because our body's not actually sensing those things? No, our body's senses never shut off. Your senses are constantly turned on. They never, ever turn off. So what controls what it is you pay attention to? And that's your reticular activating system. So let's say you bought a new vehicle. You just bought yourself a brand new white car, you know, and you've been dreaming about this white car for a couple of weeks, right? So you've been actually meditating on an image of a white car. It's actually what you've been doing. All of a sudden you're driving down the road and everybody owns a white car. I didn't know there were so many white cars in the city. Where, when did this happen? Why? Because your reticular activating system has actually been told that that was an important piece of sensory information and that it was worthy to be paid attention to. And so your brain will, will actually start to pick out these white cars. They were always there, but you didn't see them because your reticular activating system actually blinded you to them. This actually happened to me while I was like learning how to fast. I noticed all of the restaurants. <laughs> well, there's a food place, there's a food place there. I was just like, where? I had never experienced that before. I never knew where restaurants, I never paid attention to restaurants. I don't really eat in restaurants. I have lots of food intolerances. And all of a sudden that's all I could see. Why? Because my body was like, food is something I really want you to pay attention to right now, okay? <laughs> But your particular activating system is such a powerful tool because it can be told, it can be trained to pay attention to certain things. And that's what happens when we repeat thoughts and images in our heads. So what's going to happen is the more you think about doing this virtue, the more your brain's actually going to see opportunities to do it. And the more your brain's going to notice it in other people. And so all of a sudden those mirror neurons get to kick in as well because you're noticing somebody else actually doing that thing. This is where gratitude really works, right? If you really struggle with a lot of appetites that kind of bring about sorrow, you can actually train your body to be happier. It's not spiritual joy, right? This would be kind of a physical, more of that physical joy it would bring about a spiritual joy eventually. As, as the virtue develops, by being grateful in the morning, listing five things that you're grateful for. And then and at noon, maybe thinking about three different things. You don't need to write them down. You could just think about them. And then at night, before you go to bed, again, to thinking about five things, just quickly checking them off, five things you're grateful for. What's going to happen is your reticular activating system is going to start saying, oh, okay, we're looking for things we're grateful for now. Okay, cool. Well, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And you're going to be grateful all day long. And you're actually going to start being able to be grateful even in situations that are more sorrowful because that's what your reticular activating system has been trained for. So your body is incredibly powerful in your vir like virtues, two, right? Two of those virtues operate in your body and two of them are operating in your soul. So your body plays a big role in this. Okay, and then of course, I've kind of mentioned morning and night a few times, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why. Morning is critical for this, for all of these processes, because when you sleep, your, your body creates new neurons. And so you've got this fresh bunch of new neurons in the morning, and they're limited. <laughs> okay, once you use them, they're gone. Like, that's it. So you have a limited amount of neurons in the day, and so if you, like if you don't use them up in the morning intentionally by focusing on good things, by the end of the day, you're not going to have anything left. And so you, you basically have to use, <laughs> use your resources wisely. And so doing these things in the morning is especially helpful because you've got a nice fresh pool of resources. You've got lots of money in the bank so you can make a bigger investment basically. Um, nighttime, the reason it's important to do this at night is because whatever you think about right before you go to bed is going to tell your subconscious how to process the day's information. So every time you go to bed, like what happens at night is your day, your body, your brain will take all of the information, all of the events that happen throughout the day, and it will filter it through, like it basically has a filter that it runs it through 
and then we'll <coughs> store it into long-term memory, into, into, into your subconscious mind. You can tell your brain what that filter is, what you want that filter to be. So if you want that filter to be gratitude, what you have to do is actually be intentionally, like intentionally think of things you're grateful for right before you go to bed. And that will basically tell your brain, okay, we're going to filter the day out. We're going to filter it through the lens of gratitude. And that's how it's going to get stored in your subconscious. So if you're angry when you go to bed, your brain will process that whole day through anger, through the lens of anger. And it will wire it deeply into your subconscious through that lens. So nighttime and what you do right before night, really important. Don't think it's a surprise <laughs> that a lot of the saints, you know, tell you pray in the morning and then do a little prayer night. And what they do to, to as well to tell you if you want to pray all day, right? They say pray in the morning, pray at noon, pray at three, pray at six, pray at... Why? Because it trains your reticular activating system to be constantly looking for ways to pray. So, and of course, they didn't know that necessarily at the time. But like the church, the way the church teaches us to become holy, I mean, like science just keeps telling us how smart the church has always been. Like everything, everything they tell us is, is so perfectly, like is so perfect for how we've been designed spiritually and physically. Like it actually incorporates the body in that as well. So just a conclusion of what we talked about today, putting it all together. Your habitual sin is a big shining arrow showing you what area of your heart hasn't yet been transformed by God, right? So that's, you can even just work on rewiring that, that my sin is an opportunity for intimacy with God. My sin is showing, showing me an opportunity for intimacy with God. Maybe that's a little bit more clear. <laughs> the primary goal of growing in virtue is not stopping or starting a behavior. It's having our hearts transformed by God. Right? That's the primary goal is transforming the heart because the behaviors will just come, right? You plant an apple tree, you're going to get apples. You plant, plant an orange tree, you're going to get oranges. So if you just focus on planting, right? And that means the heart, you'll get virtue. Like it'll come, <coughs> it'll, it'll come naturally when you focus on the heart. And that behavior ultimately will become easy and desirable once that heart is transformed. You'll actually want to do those things. You'll desire them once the heart is transformed. And so really transforming the heart is, is the big part of that. And that takes time. And it's, it's like, it's kind of like going on a walk in the woods with God. You don't really know where the end is. He's just kind of like, he's walking you down a path. And it's going to have all kinds of spins and twirls and hills and valleys. And just trust, just trust that he's with you. If you ask him, I can guarantee you he will lead you because he, there's nothing he wants more than your heart. And so really your main job here, your main job is inviting him. Whenever you notice a habitual sin, just be like, okay, Lord. Okay. I see. I see there's an area of my heart that needs you. So show me the way, give me some clarity, show me what to do. And, and you will eventually get there. But if you add the strategies, you'll, you'll probably get there faster. So that's pretty much it. And, and I want you guys to understand too. So like the purpose, the kind of the mindset I want you to have when you start to actually take action, like in changing a behavior is, so basically you have this thing in front of you that you desire right? Because your heart is hungry. When you choose an action that's virtuous, right? What the intention in your heart that is the most useful or the best is saying, okay, Lord, I know that that will not satisfy me and I'm choosing you. I know that that will not satisfy me and I'm choosing you. And so, because we want to keep God as our end, not the, not the behavior, right? We want to keep ourselves from getting overly behaviorally focused. And so it's like reminding our hearts that it's like this whole process is about choosing God. And in, in saying, I'm choosing you, what we're doing is basically opening the door and saying, I'm hungry, Lord, and I'm trusting that you're going to come and feed me. And usually that's going to bring about a lot of ache. 
So we have one of the, one of the things you have to you have to get really good at if you want to become holy is what I call living in the ache. Yeah. <laughs> It's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. And like, you know, if you can only stay there for five seconds, hey, you stayed there for five seconds. Awesome. But that it's at the end of like what basically he's doing when you he, when he's letting you ache is he's stretching. It's like dilating like a like this. Some some people call it like a, a woman giving birth. It's like she has to dilate. Right. And it's and it's like there's pangs <laughs> that are involved with that process. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, so there's an ache and like suffering like is an ache. So it doesn't necessarily, not the same kind of ache. It's an ache of the heart. It's that, it's that ache of desire that God will, that I'm talking about very in particular. It's an ache of desire that you have to sit in and, and let yourself be in more often than not in prayer, always as a prayer, because otherwise than that, you'll just turn into yourself and collapse. But, um, yeah, learning to live in that ache and because, and basically that's a huge act of trust in God because it's like, I am literally starving here. I'm dying. That's what it feels like. <laughs> and actually you are dying because there's actually parts of your brain that are dying when that's happening. That's why it feels so real. It's another cool psychology <laughs> thing that's happening. And you're saying, Lord, come and satisfy. And I, I will wait for you. So it's, it's quite an act of trust and quite an act of faith, and it's going to require repetition and strengthening. So that's like, that's, you know, that's part of it too. Um, so there, it's, yeah, growing in holiness is quite a process, but this, this is the, the steps for building a new habit and a new behavior. Okay. So that's the end of today's presentation and the end of our series. Wow. It's amazing. Thank you so much.